جذباتی ہوتی ہیں لیکن عورتوں کے جو حقوق ہوتے ہیں وہ کس طریقے سے ہماری اکانومی ہماری معیشت سے جڑے ہوئے ہیں اس کے اوپر آپ کا کام بھی ہے ریپروڈکٹیو ہیلتھ کا تو تھوڑا سا ہمیں عورتوں کی ہیلتھ اور اس کے حوالے سے لیٹیگیشن کے بارے میں بتائیے یہ چل رہا ہے اس از ورکنگ یس اوکے اوکے تھینک یو ویری مچ ابیرا تو میں ابھی کوشش کروں گی کہ یہ جو ٹاپک ہے جو ہمارا ہماری تھیم ہے جینڈر آئی لائک ٹو لنک دس ٹو دا پریویس ڈسکشنس دیٹ ویو بین ہیونگ اباؤٹ دا اکانومی اینڈ اباؤٹ ری امیجننگ پاکستان اینڈ آئی وانٹ ٹو اسٹارٹ ود این ایشو ہائی لائٹڈ اولیئر دیٹ از این اکنامک ایشو اے ڈیولپمنٹ ایشو بٹ ون دیٹ از ویری کلوزلی لنک ٹو جینڈر اور وہ ہے پاپولیشن یہاں پر بھی جو کچھ اسٹیمڈ اکانومیز بیٹھے ہیں انہوں نے یہ ہائی لائٹ کیا ہے کہ ایک جو پاپولیشن ایکسپلوژن ہے دیٹ از ون آف دا بگیسٹ اینڈ سم مائٹ سے دی بگیسٹ چیلنج فیسنگ پاکستان رائٹ ناؤ بیکاز پاکستان ہیز دا فاسٹیسٹ گروئنگ پاپولیشن ان آل آف ساؤتھ ایشیا دا برتھ ریٹس ان پاکستان وچ از دا نمبر آف چلڈرن بورن پر وومن ان پاکستان آر آلموسٹ ٹوائس ایز ہائی ایز دیٹ آف اینی ادر کنٹری ان ساؤتھ ایشیا And, and, why, and this is a cause of concern, of course, because a rapidly growing population is going to put a huge strain on our resources. But this is not a development or uh, economic concern. This is a concern of a human concern. Because your unwanted pregnancies, hai, half of all pregnancies in Pakistan are unwanted pregnancies. Because for many complex reasons, women don't have access to contraceptives. So these unwanted pregnancies are putting a huge uh, burden on the welfare of women. And at the same time, uh, these unwanted births in light of, uh, of the poor state of maternal health and obstetric care facilities available in Pakistan also means that Pakistan has one of the, one of the highest maternal death rates in the world. But we can talk a lot about population explosion, and we have been, and we've been raising the alarm on population explosion for some time now, but we're not going to address it unless we understand the cause. And I think, and I think many economists would agree with me, many uh, social scientists would agree with me, that Pakistan's failure to stem its population growth is a symptom of systemic and persistent gender inequality. Pakistan is the second worst performing country in the world in terms of gender parity, second worst performing country in the world. In the last report taken out by the World Economic Forum, the gender parity report, Pakistan ranked 145 out of 146 countries. We know that countries that have successfully reduced fertility rates have done so by investing in women's agency and women's empowerment. Bangladesh, uh, Professor Zaidi ne kaha that Bangladesh is, is, uh, is our favorite country and as far as progress on population is concerned, it, it certainly is because currently Bangladesh's fertility rate is two births per women, whereas Pakistan's is 3.6 births per women. But Bangladesh's investment in women's agency and gender empowerment far surpasses that of Pakistan. Bangladesh has one of the lowest gender wage gaps in the world. Its gender wage gap, wages between men and women, is lower than that of some countries in Western Europe. And at the same time, currently, and actually for many years now, there are more girls than boys attending secondary schools in Bangladesh. And these indicators are, 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 are the causes behind Bangladesh's low fertility rates as well. So to address population explosion, our state must adopt policies and programs that promote women's agency and decision-making capabilities. But we have to acknowledge that there are deep barriers to achieving this, to actually attaining this investment. And there are just a couple that, that I uh, want to highlight here. One that I'm going to discuss briefly is the role that the distortion of religion has played, particularly in Pakistan's context. In the 1960s, thank you. In the 1960s, the founder uh, and leader of Jamaat e Islami, uh, Maulana Maududi, declared the then government's family plan planning program to be against Islam. 
And although a vast majority of religious scholars today agree that birth control is not contrary to Islam, we know from work on the ground that misperceptions still persist. And there are still confusions regarding the religious acceptability of birth control in Islam, perceptions that some countries have challenged, uh, have challenged, some Muslim countries have managed to influence those perceptions, but in Pakistan we have not succeeded in doing so. But another significant barrier that I want to uh, focus a little more extensively on is economic austerity. And these are particularly uh, deep barriers because this, these are economic austerity measures that are imposed uh, on Pakistan in exchange for IMF bailouts. Now, we've talked about austerity measures earlier today also. Um, Mifta if Smile Saab discussed them uh, in detail in his talk, but we know that they involve reduced public se sector spending and an increase in taxation, which is often in our case regressive taxation. And the impact of IMF-backed austerity measures on women in countries, in other countries who have been in an IMF program like Pakistan is now well documented. There is an organization called Action Aid International which reports that women who do a vast majority of both unpaid care work in households and low paid care work in public services bear the brunt of austerity measures championed by IMF, especially public sector funding cuts. When public services are underfunded, there is a triple disadvantage for women who disproportionately lose access to services, lose opportunities for decent work, and take on rising burdens of unpaid care, unpaid care work. Spending cuts that target sectors key for human development will harm women and girls disproportionately. Investments in health and education are necessary to achieving gender inequality. Not only do women and girls need better access to health and education services, it is these government departments that tend to hire women and offer employment in the formal sector. Pakistan's Lady Health Worker Program initiated in the 1990s is an example of a policy measure with the potential to improve women's access to reproductive health services, including family planning services, while offering good jobs to women from rural and low-income communities. However, Lady Health Workers continue to struggle for regularization of their employment. They continue to struggle for living wages, even as the state compels them to divert energies away from family planning to polio vaccine drives that also put them at grave physical risk. IMF requires imposition of regressive taxes and increased utility surcharges that inevitably place immense burdens on poor households, disproportionately impacting women and girls who also bear the chief burden of unpaid care work. Meanwhile, its demand for exorbitantly high interest rates stifles economic growth and reduces prospects for job growth, thereby reducing opportunities for women in the formal sector. And we've talked about how we need to increase our tax to GDP ratio to get out of the IMF program. We need to decrease public spending to get out of IMF programs. But my question, uh, and there are, you know, qualified economists, people far more qualified in this area, and I and I still don't have, and I, these are the questions to which I seek answers, that if the very conditions that IMF imposes on us are going to keep us in the debt trap, uh, then how are we going to get out of the debt trap? Um, and I think just as detrimental is the fact that IMF conditionalities do not address the fact that Pakistan's state is essentially a security state, uh, I think Kursab ne usko Papa John state kaha, so I, I prefer that term, that might be a better term to use. Where economic investment is skewed towards those sectors that advance the interests, primarily of a military bureaucracy, such as real estate, rather than industries that would spur exports and offer formal sector employment to women. Growing our real estate sector is not going to uh, in, is not going to impact women's opportunities to gain financial independence and economic empowerment. So this is something that we we need to consider. Um, you know, we had an economic uh, uh, panel here of esteemed economists who talked about the solutions that we need to go forward. And I do wonder if any IMF conditionality talks about 
those conditions, right? Does, does IMF make, for example, improving relations with our neighbors a condition to getting a bailout? Uh, Akbar Zaidi Saab ne kaha ke hum dosti nahi kar sakte Iran se kyunke IMF phir hume shayad loan na dega, lekin uh, hum unse maashi talukat formal nahi bana sakte kyunke varna hume loan nahi dega. But then I do wonder that we don't have formal economic relations with Iran, but everybody knows that smuggling is happening rapidly. So is decrease of that ever made a conditionality during IMF talks? I'd like to be a fly on the wall. I'm not a fly on the wall in these talks, but I am interested in knowing why IMF conditionalities are not addressing the structural issues, but are instead imposing regressive burdens that are paid for disproportionately by women and girls. Um, and so I just want to end with, uh, with, with talking about how the population explosion, which we do raise the alarm on, is tied very closely and is a result of a combination of patriarchy, religious extremism, militarization, and neoliberalism, but which is, I'm not talking about neoliberalism as, as a, an economic theory or program, but more as a political ideology. Our population explosion is linked to that. Uh, and um, if we want to address it, I don't see how we can do it without tackling these other factors head on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Uh, the issue